it, it, I mean, imagine if a year ago or two years ago, um, the uh, U.S. administration and the West had basically said, we're just going to come to a settlement with um, Assad, or we're going to... Uh, we're going to try and broker a situation where Assad ends up staying. I mean, it, it, it's almost impossible to imagine from a domestic standpoint um, or even from a sense of, uh, of how that would look to the rest of, I guess, the Arab pro-democracy movements there were so reform movements. There, there were so many Middle Eastern, you know, dictators or leaders being overthrown at that time. I can't imagine, you know, if they just said, okay, this one can stay, you know what I mean? No, there was, there was a sharp distinction, though, I think. I mean, there, I the first couple of months of what was happening in Syria was like you're saying. I mean, it really was very analogous to everything else that was happening in the region at that time. And it included a lot of different people. It included liberal and secularist and social. There's anarchist movements in Syria. But uh, I, I guess I think the big difference he was saying that was true between Libya and Syria as an example is that the Assad regime really does have support. And there is a base for it. It's not just like this kind of shallow thing that once you push that, the whole thing would come tumbling down in a certain sense. And I guess the, the, the question is, at what point over the course of those two or three years... Uh, was there space to basically say we're going to intervene, but in a way that will ultimately leave uh, Assad in power? Well, it, it, what's really disturbing, though, is that this is what he's always basically said was going to happen himself. And I think he did facilitate Assad. this happening. Assad said that. He said from the very beginning, including when it was just nonviolent protests and uprising, that these are all Islamic terrorists. And in fact, he released Islamic terrorists from prisons. And, you know was very conscious and the notion was is at some point to it, make the rebellion uh, to make the to, rebellion he wanted to pick his rebellion right and he got the rebellion he wanted and you know i think it is important to not lose sight of just really how obscene that government is but you know things have turned out as he wanted them we to will be out. bombing in syria i don't know when that's going to happen but it it, it, it seems to me now that it's um, there's a certain inevitability to this that we will end up, uh, I mean, you know. A year again, later with a different strategy. It's like, yeah, we, we're not going to bomb Syria in the way we were. But we're to still going right. to bomb Syria. That's right. <laughs> right. We're, this time we're just going to shift where the bombs, you know, or the general vicinity where the bombs land. And again, you know, this is... Um, this is a function of of 2003 and the the one thing that dooms uh american foreign policy is the inability for it seems to me policymakers but also um also the public and the media is to actually sort of conceptually get their hands around the idea that when you're talking about these broad geopolitical uh, questions, an action you take at one time really will ripple through for years and years to come. I mean, you would think we would just get the idea just from like, hey, we're still dealing with the implications of... of uh, Pico Sykes, right? Or uh, the uh, I know what you're talking about. Yeah. And, and the the idea that it's so hard for our body politic to accept that, like, wow, that mistake we made in two thousand three really was a big, big mistake, and. You know, you drop a rock in a very long pool and the ripples are just going to keep going until they hit something. Well, in this case, you're hitting a region where things are already coming to a head regardless. Yeah, yeah. Uh, just I uh, mean, a huge mess. But how do you get, how do you, 
get to a point where you're aware of all of that and then also know that like ISIS does kind of present something new and it does need to be addressed in a certain way. I really don't know what the smartest way to address it is, but it you cannot say like with the Taliban, they're going to do some really horrific things. They don't, maybe in Pakistan, that's a little different, but in Afghanistan, they do not present a threat to us per se. And you got to just kind of back off of it. This is different. This really could absolutely present a very different type of threat. In you know sooner than anybody could realize. I don't know. I I don't I don't I don't know. I I am glad I am not in charge of making that decision. But it is. You're like, this is where I duck out and go back to the social security meeting. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Good luck, everybody. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Next week on the Majority Report, uh, a rundown of the Emmys, and. Um, uh, just uh, out of control. Then meanwhile... Louis robbed. <laughs> Medicare, good. ISIS, no idea. I'm Sab Cedar. Indeed. I, I mean, I, I, I'm just uh, flummoxed by this. Uh, it is just, you know, the uh, Humpty Dumpty, and I used to say this back in, in 07 and 08, uh, and 06 and 05 and 04. Humpty Dumpty... Got pushed over the off the wall, and I, I don't know how you put it back together again. It's not staying completely consistent with the Humpty Dumpty metaphor, but I don't know how you put it back together. <laughs>